how far would you go to make an impact in the world? This fall, 10 incredible entrepreneurs will visit our campus to tell their stories and share the steps they took to be catalysts for change. The 2021 Entrepreneur Leadership Series, the most valuable one credit class you will ever take. Uh, tonight we have Russell Davies with us. We're very excited. Uh, and uh, his family's with him. So his wife is Tricia, and their two children, Avery and River, are up here in the front. So uh, we'll introduce them uh, shortly. Uh, one thing, just make sure each week now, I think you understand the drill. You grab a form, you list some things that you learn, you put it in that box, and then that's how we give you credit for attending. And if you don't see a check mark right away, there's a lot of people in this class. It takes a few days for us to go through all of those and enter that information. So you'll always see an, a check mark for that assignment by your name by Friday, okay? So you don't need to panic. Now, the regional campus students are submitting those online. So you just go to the assignment and you can actually type in the five lessons you've learned or you can upload a document. And uh, because they have that option, your option will say not submitted, but you did submit it if there's a check mark. So don't panic. If you see the check mark, you were here, we got your form, and we gave you credit for the class, all right? Does that make sense? So that's how we keep attendance, basically. Uh, just make sure your A number and name as it appears on the roster for the class are on those forms, because sometimes people leave off one or the other and we, we kind of have to guess at who you are. Um, the, the requirements for credit, you know, you have to attend nine of the 10 lectures. And as I mentioned before, uh, don't, don't think, oh, I can miss one if I want to, because something will always come up. You'll have an emergency, you'll have a family problem, you might have a sporting event you have to be at. And if you need to miss, just email me and I will always work with you. Okay? I'll always figure out how to make it work for you because we do want, we want you in this class. So any questions then about the class, the logistics, the rules? Okay, so we have Mikey here tonight, uh, the co-president of the Entrepreneurship Club. He has one announcement and then one of our great interns at the center, Zeus, will introduce Russell. All right, I just wanted to announce before we get started, that we have our first Aggie Pitch Competition this next Monday night. Um, it's a 90 second format, so if you have a business idea or something you're working on, come pitch it. And also, if you just wanna hear some people's ideas and businesses, opportunities, uh, come. There'll be free pizza, uh, winners get cash prizes, and then potentially can represent Utah State at a, a statewide competition in the near future. So, it's gonna be a good opportunity. All right, so I'm here to introduce our speaker tonight, Russell Davies, um, and he's here, like Mike said, he's attending with Trisha, um, their daughter River and Avery, right? Five and nine months, so they got their hands full, two little girls, and have lots of fun. Russell Davies was born in Pocatello, Idaho. At the age of 18, he then joined the, the military um, served for five years in the military, military doing tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. After ending with the military, he was awarded, um, let me get this right, he was awarded an Army Accommodation Medal with Valor and received a Purple Heart. Once he was done, at the age of 23, returned to Pocatello and then moved to White Salmon, Washington, where he got involved with the sport of whitewater kayaking. He became a, a competitive athlete in whitewater kayaking and fell in love with the sport. Um, after which he realized uh, how, how life-changing whitewater kayaking could be, helping him through the post-military life. And then he ended up starting uh, PTSD, which is Professional Transformation Sports Development. As a founder of PTSD, his goal is to work with veterans to overcome PTSD, uh, post-traumatic st stress disorder. And so as he works with these veterans that have returned from service, he uses outdoor sports like biking, kayaking, climbing, 
and I believe skiing and snowboarding. Uh, he s sets them up uh, on a road to success within these sports and allows them to be involved in, and find peace in what they're doing. Um, we, he has a quick little video that I'd like to show that kind of talks a little more about his story. So I'll play that now. When I turned 18 years old, I decided to join the military. When I came home, something had changed inside me. We lost, you know, a good amount of guys in Afghanistan, and, you know, that was, uh, that one was rough. Just the fact of having that and, and knowing that your brothers laid down their lives and you would have done the same for them is kind of a huge motivation once you're out of the military to, uh, to continue to pursue and, and push your boundaries and, and live a life worth living. My name's Russell Warren Davies. I was born and raised in Pocatello, Idaho. Growing up in kind of a small town community. As a child, Russ was a true adventurer. <laughs> he was born wide awake and he always ran. He was pretty rambunctious. He had a hard time sitting still, had a lot of energy. Overall, a pretty good kid, pretty tender-hearted kid, but, uh, but he wasn't afraid to get into trouble either. We started out as a family whitewater rafting a lot. And I got into kayaking a little bit, and uh, Russell and his brother both got into kayaking, and uh, yeah, Russell took to it. He's not as good as I am still, but he likes to think he is. <laughs> I knew right when I turned 18 that I needed to make a decision to kind of jumpstart my life, and so I decided that the military was the route that I was going to go. When Russ joined, the military broke my heart. When he first told us, I was apprehensive, obviously, because we were at war, and uh, the, the potential for him actually seeing action was pretty high. Getting boots on the ground was, was probably one of the most life-changing things that the military did for me. Within the first month of being in Iraq, we lost five guys. No doubt, war is definitely hell, you know. Um, it, it definitely will change you, I feel like, for life. I remember this one situation in Afghanistan where we were out on a, a pretty routine patrol. Uh, the vehicle that uh, I was commanding ended up encountering an IED detonated underneath the vehicle. They opened up on us with small arms fire and mortars. I knew that, you know, some of these guys were in some critical condition, ended up medevacking them out of the truck, dragging them across open fire to uh, get them to the medic. I myself had to be medevaced out. We have a uh, picture of General David Petraeus pinning that uh, Purple Heart on him in the front lines of Afghanistan. Everybody's coming home from some pretty chaotic events that I don't fully know if, if everybody is recognizing just how intense it really is going on over there. When I got out, you know, it was definitely, you know, you didn't really have a, a, a plan or a weekend plan. You know, you're, you're working, you're getting off, you're partying on the weekends and staying up late. And, you know, quickly you realize like just how unhealthy that is. They just have a hard time coming back and adjusting to civilian life. What is important to us isn't important to them. All they was doing was trying to survive. That lack of adrenaline in his life, he was making up for by, uh, by drinking and, and fighting and, you know, trying to, trying to fill that void. I had a, a really good friend. We actually ended up joining the military together. Um, and unfortunately, he ended up taking his life. Uh, and that was kind of what really hit home that something needed to be done. Time to make a change. Let go of your trouble, let go of your pain. Ooh, I say we gotta live it up today. PTSD is a nonprofit organization that I've created to bring veterans out to Pocatello, Idaho, take them through a two week introduction course to either kayaking, mountain biking, rock climbing, skiing, and snowboarding. 
When you're in the service, you're pushed to these new limits and you're, you're being challenged every day. And when you get out, if you don't have some kind of activity that's not pushing you, that's when most people start getting into things that are not good for them. And then when you get into something like action sports, it just retransfers your energy and your focus and you're consistently challenging yourself. The sole purpose is to let veterans find an escape, an outdoor escape. There's so many therapeutic aspects to it. It helped me tremendously and I know it can help other veterans. And you just get online at PTSD Veteran Athletes athletes.com you'll be able to register online and uh, we'll set your flight up we'll get you flown out there we'll take care of your accommodations and it's gonna be just a great time all around just let go of your trouble let go of your pain oh I said just live it up today all right Thank you. I appreciate it for sure. Hopefully you all can hear me back there. I just want to say thank you all for coming out. I appreciate your time and just being here uh, to hear my story. Uh, Utah State, I uh, can't, can't tell you how much this means to me. I know Andy from going way back kayaking, so it is a sincere pleasure to be here with all of you this evening for sure. So thank you all for taking the time to come out here. Um, we'll just jump right in. Uh, the video kind of gives like a quick sum up um, of how this whole thing came about realistically but uh, there's a lot of details that are missing in between for sure and so I'll just take it from take it from the top um, so I was born and raised in Pocatello Idaho I'm 33 now um, and got a I, I grew up in Pocatello till about my 18th birthday but in between that that time frame uh, I went through a series of different struggles um, I was born and raised and went to school in, in Highland High School where I was pretty much lucky enough to be able to play in any sport that I possibly ever wanted to do. My father and mother are fantastic. I had nothing but love for them. They've allowed me the opportunity to get involved in almost any sport that I possibly could. So growing up through high school, about 13 years old, my parents went through a divorce, um, and which was kind of a little bit a little bit of a setback for sure. It started getting me into a lot of altercations uh, at school and my family assumed getting me involved in boxing would be the best, the best alternative for that, which didn't really help the situation. It just made me better <laughs> at fighting, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but um, I, after, after the divorce, I, I primarily stayed with my mother. She was struggling financially for sure. And that was kind of like a big issue in my mind always is, you know, me and my two brothers were anything but angels, that's for sure. So I, I wanted to help her out in some way or form. And I was on my way to graduate high school about two months out when I got into an altercation um, with some, some people that were not from that school. Um, I believe they were like 20, 21, something like that. They came there just harassing students. Um, the two of them and I was with a friend of mine um, in which that's how it ensued we both started bantering back and forth eventually we agreed over lunch break we were gonna go meet these guys uh, and throw fists and we did so um, and upon getting to this alleyway well in Pocatello we don't have alleys we have little like parkways basically <laughs> wide open areas so we met these guys um, and him and my buddy started throwing fists and I immediately saw him reach his hand into his sweater and caught that out of the corner of my eye, immediately grabbed his arm, he had a knife, um, he had attempted to stab me, uh, was able to get him on the ground, uh, headbutt him a few times until I could get the knife away and by that point I got up, he took off running, so did his buddy, uh, we went back to school like nothing had ever happened. Um, <laughs> Without, without reporting it or anything along those guidelines, we figured, I mean, if anything, these are adult men that are on the school grounds and then they pull a knife, like, you know, and we, we were lucky to, to come out of it that day. So, went back to school about six period, I believe, got the note, <laughs> the, a police officer knocking on the door. Went with him down to the office. They asked about what had happened. Um, we explained exactly what happened. We were pretty pretty straightforward with it and the unfortunate part is I mean that was right when the zero tolerance policy was established so they were looking definitely to make 
make an example out of us for sure. Um, and so unfortunately I was then expelled from school, uh, which, was, which was pretty pretty hard to hear, but at the same time I assumed this isn't gonna stand. Like, I'm, you know, I mean, yes, we, we went off school grounds, but these people had no reason to be there. They didn't have access to the school. They also brandished a weapon. So I was, I was fairly confident that when we appealed it that everything would be let go and dismissed of. Um, so, yeah, went to a board meeting with the president, vice president, and the whole board there. I had football coaches and basketball coaches and teachers that came out on my behalf to basically say that I, I was a good kid. I had good grades. I was on track to graduate. Everything was going just fine. That this is over the top and uh, thought this is going smooth. Um, and that's when the president of District 25 said, everybody here thinks you deserve a second chance, but I don't find a different district to go to. Which, you know, for, for, for a lot of places, maybe even here, uh, Pugzilla only has one district. <laughs> like, in order for me to go to a different school to attain my diploma would have meant moving an hour or so further away, uh, which I didn't have the means to do. So I was 17 at the time. I moved out of my parents' house. Uh, it was pretty devastating. I mean, I can't, can't lie. Like, that was a hard hit to take. I didn't really know where I was going for certain, but felt like that's the next stepping stone and then I'll figure it out, whatever comes after that. Um, so I moved out on my own, realized how, how much you take for granted living at your parents' house and <laughs> eating good food and then paying for your stuff. But yeah, it, was, it, was, it really set me back and I realized something definitely needed to change. Now that my mom was single and living on her own and taking care of me and my brothers, I, I watched her slowly, slowly move backwards and backwards and backwards into debt. Meanwhile, me and my brothers were destroying her house. Um, and I realized something needed to change. And one sec. And I remember talking with a handful of buddies, my buddy Chad Cook, my buddy Andy Harris, um, about potentially joining the military. And that sounded like a great idea. Like I really wanted to prove in some shape or form that I wasn't a failure or a disappointment or a letdown. So uh, it kind of made logical sense. I knew it would jumpstart my life. I also knew that it carried a $500,000 life insurance policy. So, you know, in the back of my mind is even if I was to join the military, go off and, and end up being killed in action, that at least my dreams may, cho may close, but my family would have a lot more possibilities of, of doing something and having the funding to be able to do so. Uh, so I talked to my mother, well I talked to my father first about joining the military and he said, yeah, do it. That's exactly what you need. Uh, my mother on the other hand was definitely apprehensive. He, she, was, she said, you can wait two months until your 18th birthday. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sign an early, early joining system. And so I did exactly that. I took those two months Joined the military. Uh, I remember walking into the, like, the army recruiting doors and walking up and the guy's like, how can I help you? And I was like, well, I'm here to join. And he said, yeah, well, what do you want to do? And I was kind of taken back. I was like, didn't I walk in the army doors? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, that's about how much research I had done into the military. And he said, yeah, n no kidding, you know, nimwit, like what job? And I'm like, there's different jobs? I had no idea at that point. So I had done, very little, but I did know if I was going to join the military that I wanted it to be on the front lines. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty certain, I don't know how old everybody is in here, but that was like right in the midst, you know, I turned 18 in 2006, so it was right in the midst of definitely being in the center of, of chaos with ongoing battles uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan at that, to that, that time. Um, being, you know, wanting to be on the front lines was, well, there was, there's basically only a few options to, to ensure that you're going to be placed in those situations. And, and one of them is infantry, and I don't know if any of you guys have looked towards military service or not, but I mean, you're just a frontline fighter. You're basically designed to kill, capture, or defend any type of enemy at any point. So, um, yeah, I told him I wanted to be infantry. He said, oh, that's perfect, because you don't need you know, very much brains to go be a bullet dodger, but you, you definitely have to be in physical fit condition. 
And he'd say, you know, you've been in trouble your whole life for getting, for fighting. You might as well get paid to do it. And that's exactly, exactly how I looked at it. So, uh, yeah, on my 18th birthday, signed all the documents, came out here to Utah, went through MEPS, everything checked out, and was on my way to basic training, which is a wake-up call for sure. I, I can't speak on, on today. Like I said, I was back in 2006 of how, how aggressive it is, but it was eye-opening, to say the least. Um, yeah, they, they don't take kindly to, to, to anybody, really. I mean, there was, there was a good amount of times where I remember laying awake in the few hours that they even allowed us to, to get sleep, being like, this is, this is a mistake. This is so dumb. Um, you know, you go from living under your parents' roof and, and going by their guidelines, and you think they're strict until you meet your drill sergeants. So um, it, was, it was definitely a wake-up call for sure, but I managed to get through it. And luckily enough, like I, I could always tell myself, because at that time they were so desperate for soldiers. One, they, they allowed GEDs, which not to knock a GED or anything like that. I have one. Um, but I was lucky enough that they were able to, to let me join at that time frame due to the fact that we were in a conflict and infantry was a pretty limited place for people to be registering to go into that job. Um, yeah, three years was, was the, minim, the minimum that you could take. And so I was like, oh, that'll be a good, good idea of knowing what I got myself into before going full forth. I mean, there was a $20,000 sign-on bonus for eight, but <laughs> I, I knew I wanted to take my time. Um, and so I'd gotten through basic training, and I guess I'll stop right there, because a lot of people will ask, like, why, do you, why did you join? That's probably going to be one of like, the most common questions for sure. Um, and, you know, I did it definitely because my life was at a, at a hard spot, and I had always heard exactly that the military can change any uh, turd bag into something better. And so I assumed that that would do it. And like I said, the financial aspect of helping out my family meant more to me than anything at that time. And, and second, you have the choice in any time in life when you fail at something is to sit back, feel bad for yourself, admit failure, and continue to live that life and just sit there and be a recluse and not do anything productive anymore and let all the criticism be correct. Or you can do the opposite and allow it to light a fire under you. Prove people wrong, change the outcome. Anybody and everybody has only tomorrow can be a better day if you focus on that specifically. You have every ability to change your life drastically if you point yourself in that direction. And I figured this was definitely the best way. If I couldn't get on the right direction, this could probably help me. Um, I kind of assumed upon getting to my unit or even basic training that I would be with die-hearted, red-blooded, patriotic, you know, America-like type of, type of soldiers and other individuals. But that's not normally who makes up our military, and definitely not the front lines. Um, there are, it's, it's eye-opening. There's people that are just trying to escape their lifestyle, whether they're from the ghetto or they're from the farms. Um, there are people there that don't have the IQ to do anything other than infantry. Um, there's people there with five kids, worked on a factory job for 10 years, lost it, and there's no other way to provide for them. So you quickly realize like you have this entire crazy like scheme of people from every different background that you could ever, ever imagine possible. And, and that's beneficial because when you, when you live in those types of circumstances and you are, it is mandatory to engage with these people every single day, you quickly realize we're all the exact same. There's no difference between all of us, just a different background, different upbringing and stuff like that, but you all bleed the same and no matter what type of stereotypes you have, they're quickly abolished when you have to be in charge of making sure somebody doesn't die and, make, and hoping that they're doing the exact same thing for you. So. I had gotten out of basic training, met up with all these people from all over, like I said, people just trying to attain their visas, citizenship to the United States. Um, everybody just there for, for various reasons. And I was, uh, I was sent to the 101st Airborne Charlie Company, 3rd 187th Infantry Brigade, the Rock Assans, which is an extremely prestigious unit 
they have more war campaigns than any other unit in the entire military uh, across the board. They train hard, they fight hard, but the one thing you know when you go there um, is that you are going to be on a rapid deployment schedule. Um, so going through there, I realized this is a lot better than I assumed, for sure. This definitely beat basic training hands down. Um, but it, these people become not only your brothers and sisters, but you depend on them for your life. Like there's such a camaraderie there that I don't think like a lot of people will ever understand fully. Um, but it's, it's life changing and, and, it, and it stands as such a stone of support system that you'll never, it's hard to find that again once you're out. Um, so before my 19th birthday, uh, I was deployed to Iraq for 15 months in a place called Yusufia or they call it the Triangle of Death, one of the corners of the Triangle of Death. And like I said, you know, in the video, you know, we lost five guys the first month we were there. You're a platoon of 32 people, and, and I can't do the math, but you guys, some of you guys can. 32, you got 15 months, five died in the first month you're there. I mean, you quickly realize, like, man, there's a real possibility I won't be going home. You know, I mean, if we just lost five, and that's going to continue on that pattern, I might as well just start, start figuring out on, you know, how to, which, who's my beneficiary, you know, how to, how to de delegate money. Um, but was lucky enough going through that 15 month deployment that we had lost those five. We had had several others injured in combat, uh, felt like I knew a good amount and was lucky enough to return home. Um, that's when I was told, so now I'm like two years deep. I got another year and we're going to rapidly turn around for another 15 months. And I was told I was going to be stop loss. And I don't know if anybody understands like what stop loss is. It's pretty much when you join the military, you, you sign up for eight years, no matter what. Like you, I, I chose to do three years active. Some choose to do five. Some choose to do all eight active. Um, but no matter what, they own you for those eight years, for sure. So what stop loss does is basically needs of the army restricts you from getting out. They extend your contract and they say, oh, sorry, tough luck. We need more soldiers on the ground. You're going for another deployment. And they can continue to do that for all, all eight years. And in, in my prior deployment in Iraq, that was the circumstances. I was serving with many of people that were designated to get out, whether right before, during the middle, or any of that, and they just extend your contract. Uh, so I had already had in my mind, and I'd gotten back as an E5, I turned sergeant, had a squad, uh, of nine guys in a platoon um, that, that I was training to go to Afghanistan, you know, and, and thought I knew enough that I could provide these guys the right information. Assumed I was going no matter what, um, and this was right when President Obama was elected and came into office. And one of the first things he did that I don't think a lot of people who were ever made national news was abolish stop loss entirely. So about two months before I was going to deploy to Afghanistan, they changed the the circumstances and said, well, now you're getting out. Like, and I, I was a little bit upset and a little bit relieved, you know, at the same time, because I definitely had just seen it for, for the last 15 months of, of just how quickly your life can be over just like that. And so he, I said, well, what if, what if I wanted to stay? And he said, well, you'd have to re-enlist for the bare minimum. That'd be two more years. And uh, I thought about it for maybe half a second, but these are people that I was in similar shoes two years ago, you know, scared, no idea what was going on, put all my faith, all my trust, everything into these individuals that were, you know, uh, higher ranking than I was to, to go and, and hopefully get me home safe. Um, that's when I just made the decision. I was like, well, give me the papers because there's no way I'm going to turn my back on these people that I've just told, I'm going to get you ready for war. I'm going to get you back home from war. And I'm going to teach you everything you need to know so that we can come back and be an effective team on the battlefield. So I signed the papers two, two, for two more years, uh, extend my contract to five active. Um, and yeah, like two months after that, we were, we were in Afghanistan. And what I thought I knew from Iraq was nothing similar to Afghanistan. Afghanistan was an insane de deployment. There's no other way to put it. Um, we're activated as a, a QRF, quick relief force. 
Um, so basically, that meant instead of having like an area of operation like we did in UCP Iraq where you defend like a bubble and you go on routine patrols and, and stuff like that, you go to wherever everything's going loose, wherever the most Taliban activities, counter strikes, anything along those guidelines is where we were assigned to go. So basically living out of a bag entirely, the entire duration of it. Um, and yeah, it was, it was unreal. Um, that video goes into like a brief, a brief couple moments um, upon getting injured and, and like he read the award and stuff like that. But in Afghanistan, we were on a patrol uh, in an MATV driving down and obviously we always switch different routes. You know, if you stay the same route, obviously you're more of a target for an IED. If you're gonna take hardball roads, that just makes more sense to put an IED there. Um, and the platoon sergeant was in my truck with a driver, gunner. I was sitting in the back um, en route to a city to go look for HVTs or high value targets. Um, and en route, I was in the back doing the wrong thing, helmet off. I think I was eating like a can of tuna or something back there uh, when I thought that the driver actually had drove off a cliff. I'd seen IEDs from the outside and I'm sure people have seen videos of of how devastating an IED can be. Um, and I remember you know, yelling out, what the heck just happened? Like, did we just drive off a cliff? Like, because that's what it felt like. And then looking around and realizing, and I don't know how, I was the most unscathed person in that entire vehicle. People were critically injured. I mean, the whole vehicle engulfs in smoke. You can't see anything for, you know, a good 30 seconds, and I'm sitting there like, where's my helmet? Um, and then looking around and being like, wow, this is, this is real, we just hit an ID. Um, quickly realized how severe the situation was, for sure. Or at least I thought I did. Uh, at that point, everything, all the hydraulics, everything, all the electronics is broken down, had to manually jack the door down. Um, kind of similar to, to like you see when they're storming the beaches in Normandy and the door drops down. By the time I had released the door hydraulics and it fell down, they opened up on us with small arms. Small arms fire, RPGs, started dropping mortars all over the place. Meanwhile, we have you know, four other trucks out of a five, five truck convoy that are trying to return, return fire on the enemy. But these people aren't done. They know how to fight. I mean, they've been, at, we've been, how long has this been going on? Way too long. Um, they know exactly what they're doing. They choose their battles. They know when to fight. They know when to retreat. In Afghanistan, you're just so scattered out that you don't have the assets that you did in Iraq. And in Iraq, we'd get into skirmishes for five minutes long at the most. They'd break contact. They'd try to hit a couple of Americans, and then they'd bail. In Afghanistan, you were in it for a long time, so I quickly realized how severe the situation was. Um, we're in the middle of nowhere. Like, every, every, every resupply comes from a dumbo drop, you know, where they just push everything out of the back of the plane, and we have to go get our fuel, our ammo, our food, our water, you know, in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I start, I, I realize, like, obviously, we gotta get out of there. You're in the chamber, the bullets are just coming in and pinging six different ways and tearing people up and grab the first dude and drug him probably a good, I would say like 50 meters uh, to the medic and then had to return again six different times for every person that was injured in that vehicle. And under heavy, heavy fire. Um, after I got everybody to the medic, he was, you know, administering first aid and everything that he could do. Try to call on a nine-line flight, a nine-line medevac, so that we could get a helicopter to extract these guys that were severely injured, um, which would be 20 minutes out, no matter what. But they also will not land unless the firing is ceased. So, basically, they wouldn't land, no matter what. Um, they choose the high ground, blow up the first vehicle in the convoy. Everybody else is stuck. You can't go forward. You can't progress. You can't maneuver. You're basically just sitting in a valley, getting rained on from from above. Um, so I knew I had basically one decision to make, and that was to get to the mortar tube. 
Uh, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with mortar tubes and how they operate. It's basically just a missile. You drop down a tube, it spikes. You can set a rough trajectory for it. Uh, and so again, had to return to that vehicle to get the mortar tube, not knowing if it would work. But I mean, you know, you have two options in those situations, stay and be killed or try to change the outcome. You have, like I said, you, only you can make the difference of where your life's going, what's gonna happen next, and if you don't think on the fly and act immediate, then you're just gonna be another casualty. So I had made it back to the truck, grabbed two cans of ammo uh, in the mortar tube, ran out, grabbed two machine gun, machine gunners to just sit there and spray it at their fighting positions while, while I made it rain back. I probably went through two cans of ammo in like two minutes and that's, you know, that's wicked fast. <laughs> but luckily they were either killed or captured. Uh, they were either killed or it broke contact, I should say. Um, by that point, the, the fighting had ceased. Uh, we were able to get the nine line medevac in there and none of those six people lost their lives that day. Uh, and that award, the Armored Accommodation Medal with Valor, was uh, given for saving the lives of 30 people. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot more in depth than can be crammed into like a five minute video, but it gives you the reality of why soldiers are coming back so distraught. You're talking about majority of Americans will never one witness something as chaotic as that, have to take a life, have to watch lives of their friends being lost. And, and I mean, it's just, it's just, if you can't understand that, try to just like fathom for a moment being in that, in those shoes and watching some of the people that you love more than anything die and also imagine being in a gunfight where somebody your exact age and you are in a fight till death. And that's the, the only outcome. And so it's, it's difficult for people to, to recognize and it puts you in some, some scenarios that you'd, you'd never imagine. Um, you know, the, there's, there's things, and I'm, and I'm only explaining this because I want you to try and, and just understand when, when people don't understand why soldiers are coming back so destroyed is, you know, for instance, we were on a rooftop providing security um, for a meet and greet between our commander and the local sheikh to, to figure out, you know, why we've had so many rockets and RPGs and stuff coming from this area to our tiny little nowhere base in the middle of nowhere. And we're all sitting up on top of the rooftop and the platoon sergeant and LT say, hey, all right, it's time to go get your stuff. Let's get out of here. And you're like, oh, thank goodness. Finally, I'm dying. You know, the heat's high. You got 100 pounds of gear on you. And so you're excited, you, get, you start going down, and apparently something, another topic of conversation came up, and they're like, nope, get back up there. So we go back up on top of these huts, um, and we're just providing security. One of my guys is like, I'm pretty sure these guys on motorcycles are, are packing. You know, uh, went over there to one of my teams, saw exactly what it seemed. At some point when they said that we were leaving, somebody made a radio call to say, hey, they're about to leave. You gotta walk across a huge open field. And that's some of those, you know, some of the glimpses of those videos where we're pinned down in that open field as RPGs and stuff are happening. Uh, is that field, they would always pick that as a primary. They would hide behind cover in the, in the little culottes and pick us off as we tried to move across the fields. Um, and this was one of those unreal moments where at the time you get lucky, but none of it's lucky. Um, you know, realize exactly what they were doing. We radioed in because you're working with forces that are both Iraqi, or I should say in this case, Afghani military, people that are going, trying to start their own military, and that's our primary efforts over there is to get them trained up enough that they can defend their own country without the presence of us being there. Um, and so we radioed back and we were like, hey, we got like three, you know, targets moving through our location. Because, I mean, you don't want to kill somebody that is legitimately on their way to work for assisting U.S. forces overseas. Uh, we got the radio call back uh, that it was not, there was, no, there was no known allies in the area. And they apparently got the same. They'd stopped their motorcycles, uh, received a phone call quickly. You could see in their faces like, oh, shit, or dang. Um, <laughs> 
this is a bad spot to be. Uh, went for their weapons. Uh, we opened up fire, uh, took out three of them right out of the gate. Uh, and a fourth one managed to jump over about, I don't know, a hip high mud wall um, and was on the other side of it. Had them locked down for a while. I always prefer to carry the M302 grenade launcher that attaches to your rifle. Um, it just gives you, you know, that you basically can throw a grenade three football fields long at that point. And so I just, you know, basically was just using it to do plunging fire behind the wall, dropping grenades behind it. Um, at this point, the platoon sergeant, the LT, all the people uh, that govern how we react during circumstances like that came up. And the guy actually stood up, and you could tell he was tattered um, by shrapnel or probably gotten clipped a few times. Uh, but he didn't have a weapon, and so you're told, you know, don't, don't open fire. You're, you're not, you know, rules of engagement vary, and that ours was strictly if they don't have a weapon. No matter what, that he brought a weapon and had gotten rid of it in the course of, uh, you know, contact. But he started walking, and then just like that, like he just disappeared. It was like the craziest thing you'd ever seen. Like uh, my platoon sergeant tells me, take your squad, go down there and check out that guy that just vanished in thin air. Uh, so we did, we broke down and sent one team to clear the bodies, you always wanna do that um, immediately and took my team over to check on the mystery man. Um, I quickly realized probably about 10 feet from this spot that there's a giant well that they had dug, probably like you know, eight, 10 feet deep, I would say. Um, knowing that that guy could be sitting down there at the bottom waiting for someone to peek over, I wasn't going to designate one of my soldiers because the last thing you want to do is I'd rather not come home before one of my guys doesn't, especially when you're talking to their wives and their daughters and everything like that, and they're asking, you promise me that you're going to bring my guys home. So I went over there to look on this guy, you know, like trying to just barely peek over. Um, and you could tell he was, he was definitely in a bit of a, a concussed state, uh, but immediately realized like he was, uh, he was trying to get a grenade off of his chest. So standing about eight feet over another individual and having to make the conscious decision to end their life will affect you for the rest of your life. And this is a guy that looked like my age and I'll always remember how he looks. Um, anyway, moving forward, you have to then collect the bodies of the ones that you kill. They want to bring them back, want to make sure there was no foul pay play. They want to deem it as you know, an actual enemy. We have a bats and hide system. They take their fingerprints, their irises, um, profile picture, so that we know targets like that in the future when we come across them. Um, so I then had to go down this well and try to get this guy out of a 10-foot well. And I don't know how many of you have ever carried a limp body. They don't move well. So by then, we had our quick reaction force that was coming with trucks during our time of contact and had to drop a winch cable down it and wrap this guy in a winch cable in order to get him back out. And I, most of you know the pulling capacity of a winch cable. And ride him up almost like an elevator. Devastating, devastating circumstances that will forever play a role in your mind. And so that's, like I said, the only reason I'm, I'm getting at this is you know, to give you a glimpse in, in the idea of, one, you're numb because you don't know if you're going to make it home. Uh, you have no form of connection with anybody else there. You're there for a year, a year on end, and you're watching some of your best friends die and, and unfortunately having to take lives in the process. You see a lot of disturbing things in war. And so, luckily, was able to get through Afghanistan and get back home. You About 75% of, of our company had purple hearts from being directly injured in combat. That's how so, uh, intense it was over there. Luckily, was able to get through Afghanistan. 
I'll let them tell the story. Get back home. You about see seventy-five. A lot of... <laughs> um, so then the, the next thing happens. You know, I'd, I'd gotten out by that point. I would went home back to my hometown because uh, where else do you go? Um, you know, a lot of people make the decision of just chasing down whatever the first job opportunity that their job titles would provide them. But as an infantryman, there's not, there's not a lot of jobs looking for that. Even the police force won't allow you to join the forces due to the fact that you are trained on a different way of reacting in rules and engagements, and so they consider it a liability. Um, so basically didn't know what I was going to do getting out of the military, but I, all I'd figured is I'd sweat, bled, and cried over this country, and I wanted to go back home. So getting home is probably one of the most hard things that you can ever do. One, you just abandoned like your support system that just became your family for like the last five years that have been there through, you know, like legitimately, literally take a bullet for you. You know they would do that. Um, and you, you lose that in the blink of an eye. You know, you don't have that anymore. And so you go back home and all your friends are still doing the same, same stuff. You know, haven't done anything different. The idea of just drinking and partying, you know, and, and I, at that point I was 23 years old. Um, and you're caught in this crossfire of like, you know, what do I do next? Like, what, where does money come from? Because, <laughs> You know, I'd work some odds and end jobs, but in the military, you just sit back and your bank account goes up as you're not able to spend money in third world countries. So getting back and being stuck with that decision, I got my father like on one side of my shoulder that's, you know, telling me like, go out, build an empire, make millions, right? I mean, that's what we all watch on MTV, right? <laughs> Drive Ferraris, have tigers. So naturally, I'm thinking like, well, how do I do this, <laughs> you know? And, especially with the set of skills, I just have a GED, um, and, and also that or go to college, which, you know, at that time I wasn't looking to jump directly into anything, uh, and I had talked to my mother, and she said, y you know, you've done so much for me, your family. At this point, I'd bought her a car. I'd bought her a new car. I paid for her whole house to be resided, lawn, sprinklers, like everything, basically replacing what we and my brothers had destroyed over like the first 16 years of our lives and, and it felt good about that, but she was like, why don't you just take a couple of years to just go and enjoy the freedoms you fought for? It was something I never considered. That's a great idea. So I chose to do exactly that. Uh, my father was thrilled <laughs> that I told him I was pretty much gonna take all the money that I just saved and go gypsy. But before that, I was getting, I was doing the same thing. You know, the military teaches you, you know, a handset of skills and infantry. That's pretty much drinking and fighting. Uh, and so I was finding myself getting back into the same patterns that I was in, except for heavily influenced by alcohol or other substances. Um, and it took, it took a little run in with the police. This one. <laughs> This one is probably a story better left for another time, but we got all the time. I was in a place called Lava Hot Springs. You guys might be familiar with it. Yeah, for sure. They know me too. Um, <laughs> I was there with a couple friends, um, bought a couple bottles of liquor, was tubing the river from who knows, pretty much noon till, well, the sun went down. Uh, decided it would be a, a great idea to sneak into the hot pools. Did so, was sitting there and got like the brilliant idea to get up on the roof and run and jump off the roof into the little like four foot deep <laughs> hot pool and did and immediately was thrown out of there and while leaving got into an altercation. Somebody was like, that was awesome. And his buddy was like, that was the dumbest thing. You could have possibly like injured, injured somebody severely if you would have landed on them, which in, you know went back and forth, which turned into throwing fists, which turned into the police arriving uh, with, a, with a massive amount of, of people. Um, and, you know, in my mind, I was like, oh, I'll just outrun them. You know, and so I took off running, uh, had a police officer try to tackle me, gave him a little, just a little nudge with the elbow to get him, get him, get him off, or off my waist. 
Um, jumped into the river thinking uh, that I was Michael Phelps, I guess, and that I was just going to outswim people that can easily walk right alongside. And by now, they have like eight or ten officers there, and they're like, come on, man, just get out of there. And I'm like, yeah, you're never going to catch me. <laughs> I was wrong. They caught me with a taser gun uh, to my back. Um, and the most unfortunate part of that is my dad is an EMT firefighter. And when you are tasered, they have to call a uh, medical team to you know, check your vitals before they take you. And that happened to be him. So I'm sure he was a super proud father at that moment, um, watching me fight with 10 police officers who were just trying to arrest me. Uh, but that, that, I'd woke up from that and knew something needed to change. Life needed to change. I needed to change. Like, this is going to end up putting me in a far worse scenario than I was ever in before I even joined the military. Um, so I took those two years to basically go whitewater kayaking. I had looked back at my past, and I was lucky enough to grow up, like I said, in every sport. My parents had me in a kayak by the time I was 10 or 11 years old, learning how to roll kayaking. And so I decided to like, look into it and had no idea that people were taking it to the level that they were, running massive waterfalls and, and various rivers all over the place. And so I was extremely intrigued. But one of the issues was like, where do I go? Like, I don't know a lot of people that kayak, um, and especially not at that level that I wanted to go to. But uh, I was lucky enough to meet a buddy of mine uh, named Davis, and he has kayaked for a world-class academy. He knew all the guys that were, were running those types of draws, packed up my stuff, and we moved to Washington, uh, where I jumped on with a, a kayaking team there, started getting sponsors that were picking me up, and soon I was getting my trips to countries. I mean, the only exposure I'd ever had in any other country was third world war torn countries. That's all I'd seen. Um, but they were paying for flights to like New Zealand and Thailand and Chile and all these beautiful places all around the world that just showed me such a different lifestyle. It was just so imperative to see these people that were going with little to limited money. They were probably some of the most happiest people, excited to see you. Um, and just going on about their lives and to be that happy without having been surrounded by millions of dollars and, and fancy cars. Um, it was, it was life-changing. It was probably the thing that had changed me the most. Um, and the best way to sum it up is, I guess, the camaraderie that you experience in extreme outdoor action sports is similar to the military. If you're rock climbing 120 feet up in the air, whoever is belaying you down below, you. I hope you trust them with your life, because they undoubtedly have it in their hands. So that, to me, was astounding. The river was my battlefield. I had my plan of action on how to make it down. And you know, just like in the military, crap can hit the fan and leave you hanging on to everything that you possibly have and counting on your buddies to come into action to essentially save your life. And there had been multiple times that it had happened. This was huge for me. It, was, it allowed me to basically changed the chapter of my life. And instead of staying up late on the weekends, partying and drinking, it gave me a reason to go to bed early and get up early to get on the river. Like it completely replaced that. And I think a lot of veterans are ingrained with that high adrenaline, action-packed, heart-pumping scenarios that they've undoubtedly become accustomed to over their years of, of dealing with combat. Um, but it also allows you to almost I shouldn't say replenish, uh, <clears throat> almost completely dismiss traumatic events that are replaying in your mind day and night with new thrilling and exhilarating ones. When you're put to, pushed to those, those types of limits, your mind is registering them. And I'm a firm believer you can push old ones out with new ones and be able to do that in a positive manner. Um, and so that's when I was realizing that you know kayaking, it took me to rock climbing, which took me to mountain biking, which took me to skiing, which took me to basically anything I could get my hands on, but knowing people that were in the industry and realizing that something needed to be done. If more veterans could find this, it would probably be a massive help to everyone. So I decided to start a Facebook campaign back in, I don't even know probably around 2013, that was just basically highlighting elite athletes in various sports that were also veterans, hoping that it would change 
it, w it would influence other veterans to get involved and try to find like the same path. So I had done so. I had, a, like I said, I joined with three of my best friends uh, right when we left. Um, they were huge advocates about what I was doing. Uh, and one of my buddies, Chad Cook, he was dealing with PTSD drastically and was always right there. You know, you need, you need, you got to keep running with this. Like I always have like the best times and you're taking me rafting. Those are like the moments that I live for. It's keeping me from, you know, all my demons. And at the time I was, you know, still just traveling all over the world and just living for it and not, not probably heeding the signs that I should have. And, um, I was living in Montana at the time and I knew he was struggling really bad and I told him, why don't you move here and leave your girlfriend? We have an open room. You can get on your feet. You can start over. We can do this kind of stuff every day. And he was like, all right, sounds good. I'll do that. Tomorrow morning, I'll, I'll head that way. But I don't know if my, my car is going to make it. And I was like, OK, well, I can just come get you. And he's like, oh, well, my dad says he's going to borrow me his truck. I was like, cool, perfect. I'll see you in the morning. Pack your stuff. Um, drove back or woke up the next morning, waited and waited and waited. You know, the sun was starting to get low. And so I attempted to call him. And driving between Pocatello and Missoula, there's a good gray area of like zero cell service in the middle of nowhere. And thought maybe he broke down. Maybe he did decide to take his car. Maybe he's stranded out there. I'm going to drive there. So pursued down the road. It probably like 50 miles an hour. People hating me, trying to see, because it's dark at this time, across the other side of the freeway. and. Didn't find him until I had arrived home, and I was a little bit worried. I'd called, um, I'd called him multiple times. He didn't answer. Got up the next day. Everybody was like excited. I was home, so me and some buddies decided to go for a hike, and we were going to plant a flag at the top of this mountain that we were going to climb. And got a call from his girlfriend, and she was like, "Have you heard from Chad?" And I was like, "No, I haven't." And she's like, "Well, I'm worried about him." And I was like, "Well, I think you're part of the problem." But so I didn't take. I didn't like heat her wordings. I wasn't like a big fan of her, for sure. Um, she was like, I'm going to go have the police do a force entry on his house. Um, and I was like, I already drove by his house. You know, his car was there. He wasn't there. And she was like, yeah, well, I'm going to go do it. And I was like, OK, well, I think you're taking this way too far. And she called me right back. And uh, he had hung himself uh, in his stairwell. So that was basically the next thing that like I said, I could sit back and be distraught over it and you know, go back to my old ways, or I could actually do something, let it light a fire, let it change the way that I'm doing my everyday life. And that's when it came to me, I'm going to start this nonprofit. But I had no idea how in-depth starting a nonprofit really is. Uh, I didn't go to school for business. I didn't do anything along those guidelines. I wish I would have. Uh, it would probably help me out tremendously. I'm talking to Mike over here. He's going to help me out on some of that, so I'm excited about that. Um, but yeah, I had this great idea, but the funding that, that comes from this is, is pretty large, for sure. Because, it, well, I'll get to that in a sec. Um, anyway, I knew that the funding was going to be a big thing. And starting the nonprofit and all the paperwork and some of this legal jargon that I didn't understand, and like, how do I fill this out correctly, and your bylaws and business plan, and how you're going to operate, and linking the IRS to your bank account so they can watch like your fund transactions, and make sure you're not, you know, basically getting money from donors and just going out and blowing it, you know, on Ferraris and Tigers. Um, so, I was bartending at this place called the Sandpiper at the time. I had known this farmer who basically came to me one time and was like, I know what you're trying to do. I've seen it. I've heard about it from everybody, and I want to help you. And I was just like, yeah, sure. Thanks. Appreciate that. Like, I, one, didn't know he was a wealthy individual. Um, turns out he is. Um, but yeah, he, he basically was like, if you have a business plan, and you can bring it to me at 8 in the morning tomorrow, I will help you get this off the ground. So I was like, OK, what do I have to lose? I'll do it. Showed up there. He looked over the business plan, said, this sounds absolutely astounding. Took me to his financial advisors, um, his attorneys. Basically was like, anything that this guy needs done, get it done, and all the bills go to me only. And so he took care of that whole thing. Because honestly, without that, I don't even know how you get 
would get started with a nonprofit. It is definitely in depth, and it does cost money to get it, you know, registered. So he had handled that portion of it, and so at that point I realized, well, my dreams become a reality. This is what I've always wanted to do, and I know how beneficial this can be. Um, now I need to really dive in. So I started calling buddies that I knew were struggling with PTSD um, pretty immensely and asked them, why have you never considered getting into extreme outdoor action sports? And basically found like two common factors, and that was one, financially I don't have the money to go buy a $4,000 mountain bike and all the accessories to do it, and two, who am I gonna go do it with? Well, it's not like the city softball league where you sign up and you go meet other people uh, and get involved in it and make friends that way. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we took care of those. And so one of the biggest things that PTSD veteran athletes does um, above basically any of the other ones that I know of is we do supply them with all the gear and that is theirs to keep. So essentially what we've done is we bring 10 to 15 veterans out to Pocatello. All they gotta do is go on to PTSD, VA, veteranathletes.com, PTSD, veteran, any of those will push you right into like the same one, all those domains. And all they have to do is register and we take care of everything else. So any veteran anywhere in the nation can register for our program uh, and we fully fund it. From there, we take care of your flights, your accommodations, all food and beverages over the two weeks. We outfit you in brand new gear and that's yours to keep at the end of the two weeks. So we take somebody from not knowing anything to being fully proficient at it, and then it's there so they can chase their dreams, they can continue going on. Why give somebody a glimpse into a better lifestyle and then take it right back when you could provide them with every necessity from the knowledge and the tools to continue to do it? And we've had tremendous success. We have guys that are racing in national racing competitions for downhill mountain biking, on national circuits, we have people that are kayaking that are probably better, better than me at this point. I mean, we have had outstanding success. I've had people that have told me 100% this saved my life. I get letters from wives and daughters telling me that I don't know what your program does that is so different than any other program, but he's a different man. Now he smiles, he's living normally, he's back to work, he's bought us all mountain bikes. We all go family riding now. Um, it's been absolutely astounding to see something that I knew helped me substantially help so many others. And in my mind, that's, that's therapy to me, is, is seeing other people give them that passion. If you're waking up every day wondering why, why do I do it? Why do I do this, you know, go to work from nine to five, get off, have a beer, watch, TV until I go to sleep and then get right back up and doing it over and over it just became mundane. And you know, it's easy for vets to become recluses and withdraw from everybody and it's hard to see those signs. So if you know a veteran out there, definitely, definitely, one, reach out to them just to talk to them. Just because you can't see that they're struggling doesn't mean that they're not struggling. In the military, you're taught basically to be the most bad mofo out there and never ask for help. You no, show no signs of weakness. You're always strong. You're always better than the enemy. There's nothing that can stop you. And so I think that that gets to so many veterans that it's hard for them to take that next step. So any time that you can urge anybody to take advantage of one of these nonprofits, and not advantage, I mean, they've rightfully earned it, you know. Um, please do so. And if you need, you know, and you talk to them and you know somebody that's struggling, reach out to me directly and give me their contact. Because veterans are also good at making excuses. There's other vets that need this more than I do. Oh, my PTSD is not that bad. I have this conversation with people all the time, people that carry a firearm on them 24 seven, every day, all day. And I'm like, well, did you do that before the military? Well, no. And it's like, well, then that's PTSD. Your brain is reacting differently because of the circumstances that you now feel in danger in your own country, in your own hometown, without having a firearm on you. So reach out to vets, get them on board. Anything and everything that you can possibly do, some of these guys are definitely suffering drastically. Um, I'm not gonna take any more of your guys' time. I really appreciate you guys coming out here, listening to my story. 
Hopefully this provides some veterans with a new outlet, a new positive passion in life, a reason to get up every morning. And if you can just help me get the word out and send it along to your veteran buddies, that's all that I could possibly ever ask. And I want to open up the floor for sure for questions. I don't know what time we have, but if people have any questions or anything like that, please don't hesitate. Throw them out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was uh, that's a good, great question. Um, yeah, one of the well, one with the nonprofit. I mean, you definitely have to have a board. So you you at least have to have four people that are in, is invested into it as you are. And I talked to a buddy who owns First Ascent, which you know essentially does like outdoor action sports for for uh, people with cancer. Um, and so I had spoke with him about exactly, you know, how did you delegate your board members? And he first thing he told me was like. Go ahead and get rid of like the idea of that like, you need doctors or lawyers or people with like this huge, awesome resume, and think of it more like how driven are they? He explained one time where he had this lawyer that was on his board, knew it looked good on paper. They were having a fundraiser. They were grilling burgers. The guy that was supposed to come grill burgers got in a car wreck. He asked him to do it, and he's like, "I'm a lawyer. I don't flip burgers, bud." And so I realized like you know. I went right back to my friends and selected everybody that knew Chad on a, a personal level that we had grown up with, that we had watched my entire life, you know, grow up, and then every one of them that was there at the funeral and knew that this was something imperative that needed to happen. So I went to my friends and basically chose them with various assets. You know, one's a, a web designer and a graphic designer. Uh, you know, the other one, um, it, what was I going to say? <laughs> One's a graphic designer, uh, web designer. One um, is a specialist in like marketing, um, commercials, uh, filming, anything along those guidelines. And just kind of figured out like how to best be able to approach it. people that, that have like crowd raising fundraisers or you know being able to do, do like the entertainment industry that know how to basically chop down something massive and overwhelming into you do this, you do this, you do that. And so I would say it was pretty much immediate uh, for the paperwork aspect, but knowing that, you know, I chose mine. Every one of them is also in a structure. Like my board members are not just somebody that goes to a, a meeting in minutes and signs a piece of paper being like, yeah, that sounds like a great way to delegate money. Uh, but they also are there for every two-week class. They're there instructing vets. They've done it their entire life, so they're imperative to have out there. They help set up camping. They know how to cook. They know anything along those guidelines, anybody that basically isn't just a board member, they are a doer of all, basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? No one? All right. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, man, we have massive dreams, for sure. One of the hardest parts is, like, on average, it costs us about, like, $5,000 per, per, per participant, and we bring out 10 to 15, which is absolutely impeccable in, in our success because then they can meet other veterans that are struggling with similar scenarios that are eager to get inclined on the same sport so when they leave PTSD they gain a new friend a new support system and somebody that they continue to go on expeditions with um, and so right now we offer whitewater kayaking mountain biking rock climbing skiing and snowboarding um, but we're looking to implement fishing hunting um, windsurfing uh, paragliding Basically, you name it. I mean, we've even went as far as like even, even the mu musical aspect of it, artistic aspect of it, painting or, or art, because anything that you can develop your focus that makes you proud or feel accomplished at the end of the day is essentially like a necessity. Like, if you don't have something that you're passionate about and you're lacking something major, you just have to find out what it is. So we've, we want to broaden our horizons to basically we could, you know, help Anybody that wanted to get involved in anything, you know, is eventually where we want to get it to right now. We're uh, in the attempts of seeking a grant that would help us attain a facility. Uh, that's one of our biggest things. Um, when we have 10 to 15 veterans trying to house everybody is difficult without utilizing hotels. And I don't like the hotel aspect because then you come, you do the, do the events for the day, and then you go back into your own room and you shut the door. So we, what we normally do is rent huge Airbnbs where everybody still has their own room but still has common areas where they can sit there and they can mingle and get to know each other uh, and then be able to go off into having their privacy and closure at their own 
you know, discretion. So um, we have massive ambitions. We'd like to do it on a way larger scale. We'd like to be able to do more classes more rapidly. Uh, but right now, like I said, the funding is like probably the hardest part. It's about 50,000 per class. Right now we're doing about four to five of them a year. Um, and so that's like one of the hardest, hardest components of it, you know. Uh, PTSD isn't sitting back making money, <laughs> you know, like I have a full-time job. Every board member has a full-time job. We all take those two weeks off, uh, you know, four or five times a year to help veterans, you know, find the same thing that we love and, and we know can change their life. But right now, you know, I mean, we're, we're so limited to how much we can market or advertise or anything like that because told all the time, like, oh, if you could blow this up, you know, you could, this thing would grow huge rapidly. But when you're talking, putting $5,000 into advertising or marketing and you know there, there's a veteran, you know, potentially contemplating on hurting himself or others, it's easy to delegate where that money is going to go. So, I mean, we would just keep our, our eyes on providing people with an escape. Um, we all, like I said, work full time and everybody's dedicated to the mission. So, yeah, you know, I mean, we probably could be more successful um, if we had, you know, more opportunity, more funding and a facility, we'd be able to, you know, basically usher one class out and bring the next one in. Um, so we are, we are avidly looking to expand as quickly as possible. So. Great question. Um, we try to do almost everything and anything we can as far as like having fundraisers, concerts, uh, pint nights, things like that uh, to attain funding. But realistically, it comes down to the reason why, it, why it's based out of Pocatello. Um, Garn Theobald, he's the, the guy that approached me and said, you know, I want to help you get this thing off the ground. He contributes massively. He uh, is the owner of a massive uh, agricultural industry and so it, through that he knew other individuals that are exactly that die-hard red-blooded like patriotic individuals that really want to help and so he reached out to them meeting with them um, basically anybody that provides the military with any equipment we try to reach out to to see if they have any types of form uh, of funding that is available we apply for grants and grant right or our grant writers try to apply for as many grants as possible uh, so with that, fundraising, basically every avenue that we can think of, if you go on like PTSD VA, you can get, you know, hats, sweaters, jackets and stuff like that and, you know, that all goes back to, to PTSD. Um, so we basically try everything and anything, yeah, if, if there's, a, there's an opportunity, we're there. Um, you know, event booths and stuff like that, I've been out here to Utah many a times for things that we don't even you know, get involved in like rock crawling and I can't remember what it was, like a, some outdoor ATV like show and we'll, we'll get a vending booth there, we'll come out here, we'll sling cards, we'll try to network, we'll try to meet people that know anybody in the, in the area that would be willing to contribute. Yeah. Uh, majority of them are not active duty. Uh, getting the time frame of leave for two weeks is extremely dis difficult. I mean, we have tons of National Guard uh, reservists, um, and then those that are retired. Uh, a lot easier for them to find like the time frame. But in the active duty, you know, it would have to be medically um, basically prescribed. Like you would have to have a doctor's note saying this is essential for him to be able to participate in this the program. Guard oh yeah. Oh yeah, National Guard, yeah, we've had somebody from every branch of service possible that has participated and yeah, I mean, all we require on our, our end is a DD-214. We don't sit there and try to delegate who needs it worse. It's first come, first serve. The sooner you register, the sooner we're gonna get to you. Um, you know, and it, it goes for, you know, we, we work with adaptive, at, uh, adaptive veterans or any type of injuries. Basically, if you're crazy enough to, to want to rock climb, I forgot to start some of the videos, but uh, you know, they're all on our website and stuff like that. But I mean, we have guys that are you know, paralyzed from the waist down. We have people that are double amputees, single amputees, um, you know, everything and anything. I mean, people come in with service dogs all the time for like seizure alerts. So I mean, any veteran, if you've served, you're, you're already, you've already made all the qualifications. Like we just are there to help any veteran find that new positive passion in life.
Oh, that's in, uh, <laughs> that's out in Washington. Um, Lower Lewis Falls is what it's called. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, awesome little place to like take even the fam and stuff like that. Like the entire embankment's about like two and a half feet deep, so you can sit on top of it. And then there's just like this deep, deep, deep crevice like in the middle of it, so you can jump off the waterfall. You can kayak off of it. Uh, there's a rope swing out there. Uh, it's definitely worth paying a visit to for sure. Lower Lewis Falls. All right. Awesome. You can hear me. Uh, let's give another round of applause to him. And, and before he steps off stage, on behalf of Huntsman School of Business as well as the E-Center, we wanted to thank him with a gift. Awesome. Oh, awesome. That's, That's great. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all. Like I said, I appreciate you all listening. Really good. Thanks. All right, thank you. We thank Ross Davies for his uh, active service as well as the services he's continuing to do. And that's all we have for you tonight. Thank you. See you all for some ice cream. <laughs>